say that I thought I was background music. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I'll continue and, um, and if you want to talk a little bit, that's quite all right with me. <clears throat>
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Neil Bennett, and I'm the president of Atlantic School of Theology, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to campus this evening. Uh, this, this, this part of my job, where I get to welcome people like you to things like this, is really one of the very favorite things I get to do. So uh, tonight is, is no exception. I'm very proud of this little school, and so uh, I'm very pleased and, and, uh, and honored to welcome you all here tonight. Um, before, before I say anything else, uh, let's uh, express one more time our appreciation to Mary Lynn White, who provided the music for the last half hour.
Mary Lynn is an alumnus of, uh, uh, an alumna of AST and uh, uh, a minister of harp and voice and practiced that lay ministry for many years before discerning another form of uh, ministry, ordained ministry, and so she is uh, an ordained minister in the United Church, currently serving in, uh, at Woodlawn United Church in Dartmouth after being ordained in May of 2017. Thank you so much, Mary Lynn. Beautiful, beautiful music. And uh, before I go any further, I would like to recognize that uh, as we gather here at AST, we are on this campus also in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is the subject of treaties that were first signed by the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people uh, almost 300 years ago uh, with the British Crown in 1725. And you may, you may know that those treaties did not actually deal with the surrender of lands or resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and set the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So it is our practice at things like this to recognize that we are in Mi'kmaq. Now, tonight uh, you are in for what I know will be an amazing experience. Uh, and I'm guessing there are one or two people in this room who know Nula Kenny. Uh, and so you, like me, have had the great blessing of, of knowing Nula personally and hearing Nula speak. And uh, so I know you're going to have an amazing e evening because I know Nula Kenny to be an amazing individual. I'm quite in awe of this woman, and uh, so every time I get a chance to hear her speak, I, uh, I, I jump to take that opportunity, and uh, I just hang on every word, and I know you will tonight as well. Our mission at AST, our, our calling, is to shape faithful and effective leaders, and uh, those leaders are committed to a vision of a just, sustainable, compassionate, loving world. That's what brings people to learn and to study and to engage in dialogue like tonight here at AST. And Nuala Kenny is such a leader, as was Archbishop James Hayes, after whom this lecture event tonight is named and after whom our Hayes Center is named. Uh, James Hayes was a founding father of AST, a man of Tremendous vision, but uh, the heart of a caring, caring soul. And so his legacy is here in this room tonight uh, and carried forward in many ways by Nuala Kenny. Um, and so this idea of leadership in this time, to me, actually connects very directly to the topic of uh, tonight's uh, conversation. Uh, it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine advancing that vision of a world, a loving, compassionate, just world, without thinking about how society looks at death and the ways in which the, how we look at death limits life and our fullest expression of life. And so uh, it seems to me that um, tonight's conversation about dying and about death is in many ways a conversation about leadership and about the kind of world we want to shape together. But you didn't come here to hear me, and I'm gonna get out of the way very soon, and David McLaughlin is going to do a much better job at introducing Nula in just a moment. But before I wrap up, I would like to thank the sponsors and supporters uh, who have made the event tonight possible. The Patrick Power Foundation, the Morrow Foundation, and a number of very generous, uh, supportive, and uh, um, com committed individuals. So, in short, thank you for being here. I know you will love uh, this evening's message and conversation and learning. And uh, I, I just encourage you to keep in touch with AST. We have events not exactly like this, but we have quite a calendar full of lectures and, and events and symposiums and uh, and opportunities to learn. So please, please keep in touch. Check out our website from time to time. You may find something further to uh, that catches your eye. So without without further ado, Dr. David McLaughlin. Well, 
Well, good evening, everyone. And indeed, with uh, my president here at the school, I welcome all of you to this event this evening. It's my pleasure to be your MC, so I will accompany you through the lecture and then into the discussion period. And it's my pleasure to do that, uh, not because necessarily that I would come here just on my own, but my dean phoned me up and said, you better be there because I can't. And so <laughs> I'm here sort of filling in for him and uh, welcoming you and helping us through the evening uh, with what skills I have uh, because my dean is away and uh, this is of course the time of travel for everyone certainly for academics and um, uh, I'm very pleased to do that pleased to see all of you and we do hope that you have uh, refreshed yourself with some of the refreshments uh, as you came in and that you'll feel free to do that throughout the evening because there's still food and drink um, available so uh, I know that you will enjoy the evening, and we hope that you will do that and feel free to do so. I just want to say two things, though, two points here before we begin. One is to acknowledge Archbishop James M. Hayes, who was Bishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Halifax, here in our midst and when he was with us uh, here at the school. Um, I know the, Halif the Archdiocese is probably known as Halifax Yarmouth, but I think when Archbishop Bishop Hayes was here. I'm not sure it was uh, known as that, so this is, uh, this is the title. But we're very happy here at the school to have a center named after him. Archbishop Hayes was known first as a pastor of souls. His profound commitment to bring pastoral care to the suffering was central to his ministry. He brings deep, uh, brought de uh, deep respect for the sufferer and a deep commitment to the one who is the source of life. His compassion and care for people of every faith and for those who profess no faith tradition was characteristic of his person and ministry. The Hayes Center at AST was established in 2015 and this event tonight inaugurates the program series for 2018 and 19 and it's great that you are all here tonight to witness that inauguration. Now I must say a word of introduction for our speaker, and I know most of you probably know Dr. Kenny, and uh, she's told me to give you the Johnny Carson introduction, but I'm not going to do quite that. <laughs> Sister Dr. Noella Kenny is a member of the Sisters of Charity and a graduate of Mount St. Vincent University with a BA degree and Dalhousie University with a medical degree, with postgraduate training in pediatrics. After holding leadership posts in medical education in Toronto and Kingston, Ontario, Dr. Kenny returned to Halifax in 1988 to assume the position of professor and head of the Department of Pediatrics and chief at the IWK. In 1995, she became the founding chair of the Department of Bioethics at Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine. Dr. Kenny is the recipient of seven honorary doctorates Dr. Kenny was also appointed an officer of the Order of Canada in 1999 for her numerous contributions to child health and medical education. Her newest book, Rediscovering the Art of Dying, came out in 2017, addresses the issue of the medicalization of human suffering. And I will say at this point, her book will be available to you tonight after the lecture and discussion. You'll be able to buy a copy. But uh, although I know that most of you know Dr. Kenny, I think we need to acknowledge indeed her presence among us and her history, her knowledge, and her gifts that she brings to us. So at this time, then I ask you now to welcome Dr. Kenny to this lecture. Well, here's Nula <laughs> would, would have been just fine. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm honored to be here. Uh, for those of you who do not know this, I am a former chair of the board of the Atlantic School of Theology. And so I had an, an, an opportunity uh, really fairly young in my career to be on the board and then to be chair. For, so I have a long, I have a long history. Uh, and I'm honored as well because this is a Hayes lecture and Archbishop uh, James Hayes was a very dear friend of mine, a bishop 
and a mentor in Christian discipleship. So what I'm going to do tonight is fitting in with some interesting conversation that Mike Brownlow and I had about this series and trying to look at ways other than lecture or usual public debate to raise awareness about issues of human suffering. I can lecture with the best of them. <laughs> and I want to share with you in the experience of writing this book, for the first time, my writing of stories. Now you need to remember, I am Nula Patricia Kenny. If I wrote my first name in the full Irish, it's Fanula. I'm a Celt. I belong to a long line of Celtic storytellers, Shanachies in the, in the Irish Gaelic, and I didn't even know I had that in me. All of my hundreds of papers and my other three books are, they're, they're from the head. So I'm going to share with you something different, as, as Monty Python, the great philosopher theologian says, and now for something completely different. <laughs> But it's part of what I believe Atlantic School of Theology is about in trying to raise consciousness using all forms of human communication and interaction about deep issues of meaning. So that's the journey we're going to embark on together. Now let's see if we can get going here. Whoops, what did I just do? Where's my buddy? Did I just turn it off here? Don't you love technology? Just I just came back from a week of lecturing at, in California, and the type UC San Francisco, and the title of my five week five lecture series was Belief in Technology. <laughs> Very serious five lectures. It, it, San Francisco is the technology capital of, uh, of 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 the world now. So, don't go till I can make sure I get the second one. So we're going to talk about what I'm calling the art of dying and stories of sickness, suffering, and death. So the art of dying is part of the title of this book that I wrote, and I'll tell you about that in a second. So in regards to Archbishop Hayes, after whom this is, is named, from the acknowledgments in my book, you'll see a special section that says this. My now deceased friend, Archbishop James M. Hayes encouraged me that this project was something I should and could do. His support and witness to care for the sick and dying carried me through difficult days. This was the most intense spiritual experience of my life. 11 months, hardly anything else was done. For the last four months before the book had to be delivered to Novalis, the publisher, for four months, except for Christmas Day, I read one of the four passion narratives from start to finish. For four months. Most intense spiritual experience of my life. And without Bishop Hayes' support and encouragement and witness, I don't know if I could have done it. As a teacher, I, I do feel the need to tell you what I hope to accomplish, what I hope to share, my goals for the next hour with you. So there are really four points that I want us to cover. First, I want us to recall together the Christian tradition of a good death. And the medieval art of dying. So I want us for a bit to go back in Christian history and begin to think of the tradition of a good death and the medieval art of dying. I then want to take a slight detour to identify the power of stories in our lives. The genre of narrative literature 
I then want to reflect on Jesus' story of suffering and the stories Jesus told. Remember, he tells parables. These parables are his little stories. The stories Jesus told about how to respond to the sick and suffering. And then finally, I want to consider, I'm going to share with you, if we have time, all three of three stories in the book to see how I tried to use the genre of narrative, to use the power of stories to help me and I hope my readers and you as listeners begin to think of your own stories begin to think of the issues that are important in care of the sick, suffering, and dying through the experience of others. Now, you know, I think all of you, that there is no scriptural account of the death of St. Joseph. But there is a powerful early Christian piety about St. Joseph as the patron of a good death. Just a little aside, as a professor of medicine, who's never worked in a Catholic institution, I'm a professor of pediatrics. We have no Catholic children's hospital. I'm a professor of medicine. We have no Catholic medical schools in this country. Just, I'm a very public Christian Catholic uh, in the world of medicine and healthcare. Teaching medical students and residents, I still recall the time in the secular setting, I was using the expression with residents, the session today is talking about the ethical issues and concerns in providing a good death for patients. And a third year internal medicine resident shot his hand up like a bullet in the back of the room. He said, Dr. Kenny, what do you mean a good death? How can any death be good? Because his perception was that death was a failure of medicine, not a natural, normal human event, and for us, not the end of anything, but rather a transition. So, the powerful tradition, just look at this somewhat romanticized, but picture. I want you to see in the features, and this is a nice example, I'm going to be talking about narrative, but this is an example where art is another form of nonverbal expression of fundamental meaning and issues. Because what we see here is Joseph, the just man, the man who tried to do everything that God had asked him to do, even when what God was asking seemed impossible, dying ready to go to God, ready for judgment because he has done his best, dying at home, in the presence of his beloved wife and the beloved son he was asked to raise and bring to manhood. Ready to go to God, peacefully at home, surrounded by loved ones, and as one lay person pointed out when I did this in, in dialogue in a parish a couple of months ago, what you see is Joseph and Jesus are fixed on each other. There's not just accompaniment, but there is a rooting of Joseph in Jesus. By the time we get to about the 1400s, what we see developing is what an, an, a form of teaching and preaching and writing that's called the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, and the Ars Moriendi was, in fact, linked to the Ars Vivendi, the art of living. In order to die well, you had to live well, and you had to live well in preparation for dying. Remember this. Until the second half of the last century, second half of the 20th century, people died rapidly. There was no chronic illness. <laughs> there was no chronic illness in, 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 in the time before the late 19th early 20th century. So in fact, people had to live constantly in preparation for death because it could come like a thief in the night. 
Then we have the great plagues which occur, particularly in Europe, where this art emerged. And now it occurs not only rapidly, but with large numbers of persons, so that any possibility that the priest or minister could come and attend to the dying person was just impossible. So the medieval Ars Moriandi, the art of dying, assisted individuals and communities to live in preparation for death whenever it might come. And it assisted them to identify the kinds of temptations to impatience and despair and loss of hope that might occur in, as they were dying, even as it was compacted in time. This is crucially important. Think of arts and crafts. All arts and crafts are learned in some study of the mechanics of the art or the craft and from mentors. If you do rug hooking, some of the women in the room, I'm sure, hook rugs. That's a craft. You, learned, you read little bits about it, but you had to see someone doing it. And then you had to have the experience that was mentored. Now I'm going to try. No, what you're doing, no that's, the knot goes this way. So when we talk about the art of dying, we are talking about something that is learned. And it is learned from study, from mentors, and in experience. This is crucially important. Excellence in the art, like excellence in painting, excellence in sculpturing, excellence in the art was celebrated. So excellence in dying, whether heroic dying or just peaceful, good death dying, was celebrated, and it was celebrated in stories and in art. And I do know, for example, um, one of my favorite examples, and I've used it in my lectures, is the art of Robert Pope. For those of you who have never seen it, uh, outstanding that a young man captures, captures in his experience of cancer with my good friend, Dr. Ross Langley, his doctor, an experience that you can see the experience of cancer and dying and care and the hospital from inside this young man's experience. So both stories and art help us get inside and celebrate good dying. Now the important thing here is that the medieval Ars Moriendi, a social, cultural, communal reflection on dying, talking about it, preparing for it, depended upon two fundamental features of the culture. One was the shared faith in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was shared. It was shared. Jesus' Jesus is dying and resurrection was for us an Africa. Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. That was a shared belief. The second phenomena of the culture was the importance of families and community in social organization and care for the seriously ill and dying. Again, until we come to the late 19th, early 20th century, all care for the sick and dying was in families and communities. It was not professionalized. Please understand, I'm a professor of medicine. I'm in the chief of two children's hospitals. Big machines, technology have done wonderful things. But I also recognized we have now professionalized every aspect of care of the sick, suffering, and dying. And, and we'll come to that when we talk about the medicalization of death, which has occurred in a recent Supreme Court decision. But the important thing here is that this Ars Moriandi, shared faith and the importance of family and community and social organizations, this was written about in terms of the interfaith expression between the late 1500s and mid 1600s, the Lutheran Martin Mahler, the Anglican Jeremy Taylor, an amazing work by Jeremy Taylor on the art of dying. And of course, the Catholic tradition at this time was best exemplified by Robert Bellarmine's, the saint, his work. 
But this was, this was all Christian communities in the 15th, 1600s were talking about the art of dying. I want you to think a minute about the features of our culture. It ain't the way it was. First, I would identify as a physician. The death-denying and death-defying nature of contemporary society. Now, we've always been a bit death-denying, even, even when we had belief in, in resurrection. But we've not been death-defying until the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, I would suggest to you that, and please, no one do this for demonstrative purposes. If one of you dropped down now with a heart attack, what would you expect? You'd expect Dr. Kenny to call, is there any nurse? And I know there's nurses in the room, thank God. <laughs> thank God, I, a whole, I know a bunch of you, okay. Who's the nurse with the most experience in cardiac arrest? We, you would expect that we would get down and do what I call the thump and jump. <laughs> that we would resuscitate in such a way that in fact the person would be up back in the chair and participating till the end of the lecture. Just remember this, when Sister Nula makes you laugh, next comes a zinger. <laughs> because in actual fact, you would, going back to my lecture, belief in technology, you would even be tempted to believe that if I couldn't get you up, it's because she's a retired pediatrician and she hasn't done clinical practice for 10 years. <laughs> the nurse really didn't help her. The EMT, my father died because the ambulance arrived too late. What? <laughs> what I need you to understand is that we, in fact, have had such marvelous advances in modern science and technology from the time I started medical school that dead is not dead anymore. People are resurrected every single day in hospital. And so people have now come to assume that if it can and does happen, it always will happen if I have the right equipment and the right doctor in the right hospital. So if we couldn't do it, the IWK sent us to sick kids. I was four years at sick kids. We couldn't do it at sick kids. Let's go to Philadelphia Children's. Let's go experimental treatment in Mexico. Just begin to think of our culture and how we, as, as President Bennett said, how do we begin to respond to the issues of dying? Death denying, death defying. Second. We are in a society that is post-Christian and post-Christendom. If you don't know that, my friends, you're not paying attention. Post-Christian and post-Christendom. Post-Christendom means that the rules and laws and societal mores no longer support our belief. Moreover, we have had a very interesting corruption of language in public discourse, particularly around death and dying. Mercy killing, the right to die. Even Bill C-14, which has regulated the Supreme Court decision, is entitled Medical Assistance in Dying. Bill C-14 is not about medical assistance in dying. That's what good care and good hospice and palliative care are. What has been legalized is medically assisted death. But whether you agree or not, and unfortunately across the Christian community we're not in total agreement, let's at least be clear about what the issue is. Dying is the process. Death is the event. I've been at resuscitations, literally had to pull pediatric residents back off of patients. I'm calling this. Death occurred at 728. Death is an event. Dying is the process. Moreover, we have an environment counter to the medieval society with a common understanding and the role of community being important in care, we have a society where individual rights, individual choice, and control dominate. Dependence, the greatest sin. A good death is a chosen and controlled death. Rights, rights, rights. Following all of this, we also have belief in technology to cure all of our ills. See, I really should get a little Botox. 
And, you know, I've always been small. Thank God I was a nun. But, I mean, <laughs> I could have it bigger. I mean, every aspect of our life that gives us distress now has a medical procedure, a drug or a device. Begin to think about this. I know someone who can take the, the um, issues of the seven deadly sins and begin to map it to all the areas in our lives where we now have a prescription or a procedure, medical procedure. So, it naturally happens then that the medicalization of suffering and death, which occurred in the Supreme Court decision and was regulated in Bill C-14, now in less than two years since the regulation, has been so rapidly normalized they just, just, I have given another lecture to my colleagues in medicine where I despair of the morality of medicine, where a 2,400-year interdict against intentionally ending the lives of patients has been overturned. And I'm not talking Christian. I'm talking 2,400 years in the Hippocratic tradition, now rapidly normalized, even for those who, in fact, are believers in Christ's suffering and in the resurrection. So... What happened to me was, in Nula's story, public involvement, public debate, the only person standing up there at the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Committee who was trying to minimize harm to the vulnerable of this, who was trying to protect conscience over against every other member of the committee, National Committee, Advisory Committee on Legislating Supreme Court, the only one who was opposed to medically assisted death in the wilderness, in the wilderness. You're a prophet in the wilderness. <laughs> so, I'm pretty articulate most of the time, but I decided there's got to be another way to deal with this issue. And that's what I turned to the power of stories. Now, remember what I told you, that for the ten and a half months of writing this, and in the last four months except for Christmas Day, I read one of the passion stories, the story of Jesus' passion from one of the four authors of the Gospels every day. So I was being formed in the power of stories, Jesus' story as told by the, 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 the four who were writing it. So let's think a bit about stories, because I think that my claim that we celebrate good death, good dying, good response to medical problems, we celebrate that in stories and in art. I think that what we need to do now is think a bit about stories. I love this quote. <laughs> Actually, it comes from a totally different, it's from Theology on the New Cosmology, which I have to read for my religious community. But look, at the, look at the quote. This is gorgeous language. We acknowledge and live our lives in and through stories. The bones upon which we hang the flesh of our lives. Think of your story. Think of your family's story. Why do you think after 50 years of people becoming radically independent and autonomous, we have all the interest in ancestry DNA. Duh, as the kids say. We need to know our story. We need to tell our story. Our communal story, I and mean, then the very nobody else's story is your story. I'm a baby doctor. <laughs> you do know that the rituals, particularly bedtime rituals and, and meal rituals, are very important for children's identity. And can you, I mean, one of the powerful images about stories is reading stories to little ones, especially before they go to bed. Stories. I'm claiming we read stories to children, we listen to, some people, they wake up to the news. How you do that, I do not know even before false news and all. <laughs> right? But immediately they have to have the news on. They have to have the stories of the day. But we share vacation stories at work. 
around the cooler. You know, what, that's part of the way in which we interact. What did you do when you went to Florida? What did you do? We retell stories at family reunions. I can never get together with my brothers. I have young, all younger brothers. And sometimes they say I was pushy when I was. <laughs> that is not a true story of our growing up. But it's the one they all tell. <laughs> we never get together. Where at, before we finish the time together where someone says, do you remember the time when Uncle Jim and Aunt Molly came for Thanksgiving and Uncle Jim made mommy her first martini. <laughs> and she put orange juice in the mashed potatoes. <laughs> but don't you all have those? I mean, she, I mean, she, had never had, she had never had hard liquor before. He made her a martini, you know, the container with the orange. And she put it and she couldn't take it out. So we had mashed potatoes with orange juice. Think of your stories. Nobody else's family has that story. That's my story. That's a Kenny story. What are yours? Begin to think of that. And crucially, 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 all of our faith traditions hand on stories. Why? Because faith is not just a me and God thing. We're all blessed, if we are persons of religions, to have a communal story, a communal ability of celebrating and support. We also today recognize we have long stories, we have long books that have been written, we have short stories about a person's experience, and increasingly today, and this is, I'll show you this in a sec in more detail, we have blogs and social media postings. If you read those, and I don't, I hate these things, but I've done it for purposes of learning, and, and penance. <laughs> Increasingly what you see, and this is going to be important for us of faith traditions, you see blogs that are revealing intimate details of experience of difficulty and suffering and pain and that you would think, why would you be sharing that with anyone other than those closest to you or in pastoral, right? But it's a, a vehicle, so, so hold. I'm saying we are people of stories. So what are stories? Well, as a genre, as a genre, stories are part of the narrative genre. You know, there's all different kinds of genre in, in literature. And stories have, have a feature, narrative has features. It's got a beginning, it's got an unfolding of events, and it's got an end. Now hold to that because you'll see when we talk about stories of illness, Sometimes people think that the whole story of illness is the beginning of the illness and the end of the patient or the illness. But that's an episode. <laughs> it's the beginning of the life. It's the life story in which an event or an experience of illness occurred. But just, just watch for the features. A beginning, an unfolding of events, and an end. A narrator, story has somebody who's telling the story. So I'm going to tell you two stories in a little bit and a listener or a reader, depending on whether you're doing it orally or you're writing it down. Narrative is concerned with how individuals feel and also how others feel about them. Narrative is not fact. It's not a text to be published in a scientific journal with facts. Stories demand empathy and engagement in the way that no lecture can, I believe. Watch television. See, see, when you see the, the story unfolding, it's a real live person. or you, you actually feel yourself coming out of your own isolation and protection and in, involving yourself in the experience. And narrative knowing, a way, narrative is a way of knowing there's a fabulous classic article on this, helps articulate issues of identity and meaning in our whole life story. Sometimes you can't articulate what are the deep issues of meaning in your life, but if you can tell your story, they come out in a way that's usually easier 
to speak because telling a story gives you a certain freedom. So, I want to now move to this issue of stories and healing, and I want to read one or two. We started a little late because you didn't do Here's Nula. I, I, wanna, I want you to, 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 to be rooted in this understanding. Here we have a scene. This gentleman is dying. He's in a hospice palliative care unit. God love hospice palliative care. God does love hospice palliative care. I want to, you to be clear that the dying man, his beloved wife and best friend for 52 years, and the doctor who's caring for him all have their own stories of this same sequence of events. All of them are experiencing certain challenges of meaning, and all of them can, in fact, create a story of the same event. Early on in my medical career, because I was doing medical education a lot, I became fascinated by the way in which we taught young doctors to take a case history, a medical history. So many of the lay people may not be totally aware. Every nurse in the room knows what I'm saying. The medical case history, and I can tell you it's, it's like morning report. 42-year-old white male admitted to the emergency department at 2 a.m. He has a four and a half a year history of congestive heart failure. Four and a half hours before the... It's, got, it's formulaic. Even the, the larger medical history that you've been through them all, everybody here who's been in hospital, big, long, it's supposed to go back over your past history, details. What I want you to understand is that the way doctors have been taught is a unique structured genre with a specific purpose to rule out the irrelevant. Ah. The irrelevant meaning anything irrelevant to the diagnosis and medical treatment. But if you want to think of care of the patient, <laughs> those things that are irrelevant are in fact most relevant. Because each individual has a unique experience of the same diagnosis any two of you in the room, bone cancer of your lower leg, pathology is the same under the microscope, neither of, e of you will have the same experience as the other. It, it will be a totally different, one of you is a competitive lifelong runner, the other is a brand new grandma. One of you will say, take the leg off if it gives me longer time to visit with my grandchildren. The other will say, there's no way in God's earth you're taking this leg. My bodily integrity, I'll take a, a higher risk of dying, but dying with my leg on. Everyone has a unique experience, and these are captured in stories of illness. What we have seen is that for a long time, a day in the, de in the death of Ivan, Ivan, Ivan Ivanovich Tolstoy, remember that story? It's a guy who thinks he's sick, and it's, it, it's, a, oh, it's a Tolstoy story. But it's a story of illness and the experience of someone who thinks and is, whose whole life is dominated by the possibility that he's going to die from a medical condition. But what we've seen in our time, basically the last 100 years, is the emergence of pathography. Not just stories of illness, but a whole subset genre, pa, pathology, illness, ography. <laughs> this genre, go, go now to chapters or Google. I, I Googled, for example, breast cancer. I'm a breast cancer survivor, eight year breast cancer survivor. I Googled breast cancer patient stories. There's a whole, there are more than 3,000 <laughs> on a, a special website. Now, most of them are short stories. But that's just one condition. 
So what we're seeing in our time is that persons, when the religious meaning and context for illness and dying is eroded, they still have to search for issues of meaning. It's a fundamental component of illness, disease, disability, dependence, and dying. So they look for the telling of a story to help create some kind of sense of meaning. So the stories, stories are autobiographical, they're biographical. The big one now is celebrity stories. Think of all of the, of the major the movie stars, they tell their story of the experience of illness. Because if you're a celebrity, you can get the message out. And there are a wide variety of conditions from anorexia and acute myolateral sclerosis, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, to Alzheimer's. Very interesting genre of people at the beginning of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's going through to see very interesting genre because when they're telling of their story, you actually see what's happening to their brain. Okay. Stuck. So, pathography, because we're going to begin now to look at Jesus' story, and then I'm going to read a few of the stories. The pathography, these stories of illness, provide meaning, context, perspective, and the patient telling their story of their illness can help them give meaning to the illness, but may even help them, especially stories of dying, rewrite their whole life story. We know that dying with a good life story as a legacy is one way to have a good death. That the actual legacy is the good, the good story of your life left behind for your loved ones. And pathography encourages real dialogue. The telling of the story of your illness is inherently therapeutic. So, narrative I thought was important. And then I began to look at the story of Jesus and Jesus' story. Matthew, chapter 9, 35. The story of Jesus. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and sickness. Jesus' story is the story of healing and reconciliation. It is the story. God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die for us. It's the story of Jesus. And in the slides, I then have two pictures that are pictures of Jesus' cures. So one is Jesus curing the daughter of Jairus. Ooh, powerful. And the other, my favorite, favorite, favorite cure, and only the women in the room understand this one, Sorry, guys. Favorite, favorite cure? The woman with the hemorrhage. And the classic painting, you don't see Jesus. You see him from the waist down and the woman on the ground just wanting to touch his cloak. Okay. So in the daughter of Jairus, Jesus responds to a father's plea for help. In the woman with the hemorrhage, she doesn't even, get, she doesn't even feel she can say anything but when she touches him, and he's, he says, someone touched me. And the apostles say, are you crazy, Jesus? What are you talking about? They're pushing and shoving all over the place. Someone touched me. It's like the answer with, with the leper. If you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus answer, of course I want to. So we actually have Jesus' care of the sick, giving physical care and comfort, but healing the whole person. It's characteristic of Jesus. So he didn't ignore the physical symptom, but he also attended to the spiritual and, uh, component, the disintegration that illness and disability brings, and he restored the individual to the community. So the story of Jesus' life was compelling for me, is compelling, but also the stories that Jesus told. So one of the things I have uh, in, in the slides is a picture of a story Jesus told. It's the Good Samaritan. This is a, 
isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? Jesus is asking in this story, so who really is the neighbor? Who really is the person who provides accompaniment to the fellow that's bleeding on the side of the road? It's not the religious leader, and it's not the fancy schmancy lawyer political leader. It's a feared and hated Samaritan who is the one that gets off his little donkey, makes himself vulnerable, and goes to heal. So Jesus' story, so the story of Jesus and Jesus' stories have much to tell us. Then I'm coming to the book and the stories, one or two that I want to read. This book is totally written, predicated on the belief, as is expressed in Hebrews 4.15. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weakness with us. But we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. My firm belief, because this book goes to the story of Jesus from Gethsemane to resurrection, and every step of the way, we see Jesus experiencing some form of suffering, and we see his response, which I believe can inform and support and console us in our medical choices. So where do I start? Gethsemane. Father, I don't want to do this. Father, I don't want to do this. Father, if it's possible at all, please, I don't want to do this. The natural human tendency to avoid suffering and distress. This is, this is, this is the Son of God, fully human at this time, crying out. But what happens to him in this is clear. something happens between the second and third time he comes down to get the apostles who are so grieved that they fall asleep and he's alone in his suffering and he Jesus comes saying I will trust in the love of the father no matter what and he heads to Jerusalem <coughs> let's see we can there's Jairus there's the Fed, there's Jairus there's the Good Samaritan. This is where we are. So, in the book, in every chapter, and only two of the last three chapters are on death and dying, the chapter begins with a challenge to accept, as Jesus did in Gethsemane, that you are suffering, that you are going to be in need of help as you endure something awful. And then there are chapters about medical decision making, ordinary medical decision making. If you can't see how the way you approach ordinary medical decision or medical technology in ordinary and increasingly serious conditions affects you at the end, you're missing the point. You, you begin to develop ways of either believing in technology or avoiding talking about things and sharing and acknowledging the spiritual issues or denying. So we begin that way in, in the book. So the sources of suffering uh, that I explore are a whole bunch. Here's some it's explicit specific chapters in the book with stories. I want to read to you now one of the stories. You know that dying with dignity and the loss of dignity is one of the main reasons people request medically assisted death. Dignity is a huge concept. If you read the Passion Narratives again, you will see that Jesus suffered enormous indignity. Read, read them. I mean, it was, it's awful. What, what, once, in fact, he got into trouble and you, you've got the high priest and Pilate and all these people. I mean, the soldiers treat him like he was dirt, right? He's, he's vulnerable. It's what people do. And so they really... So, 
They spat in his face. They hit him with their fists. Others said, play the prophet Christ. Who hit you? you, you look, hey, hey, you saved others. You can't save yourself. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mocking, uh, profound. I think that this sense of dignity gets captured in this story. At the age of 37, Ellie's already shaky and marginalized existence was further undone by a diagnosis of advanced cervical cancer. She had a radical hysterectomy where the gynecologist removed her uterus and much of the surrounding tissue. Ellie, in the wry, bordering on sarcastic way she communicated most of the time, reflected that life had gutted her as a person and as a woman many times before. But this was the ultimate evisceration. Born into considerable privilege, Ellie's early years were magazine perfect private schools, lavish vacations, doting attention of her socially acceptable church-going grandparents and parents. She wanted desperately to please her family, but felt she never lived up to their expectations. By the time she was 14, her parents' frequent admonition, to whom much has been given, much will be demanded, became the standard for her rebellion. Ellie could recount the harsh facts of the history that set her apart from her family. A pregnancy at 16, marriage to the son's father at 17, a second son at 18, episodic substance abuse, poverty, and domestic violence, where she described herself as a cheap and available punching bag. She described her life as a kind of chaos that makes for great soap opera. Her family regularly offered lifelines, but Ellie believed, I had no way back to them. I did this to myself. I'm a disgrace to them. She was finally forced to accept help from her family when her teenage sons discovered their bo father's body, lifeless from a drug overdose in the basement of their home. She gave over the care of her children to her brother and began the slow work of recovery. She courageously dealt with her substance abuse, upgraded her education, and found employment as a paralegal in the law firm of a family friend. But she was always fearful that others saw her as damaged goods. Her sons maintained a tenuous relationship with her. Ellie says that even after she cleaned up, she played the family role of the loser relative with a shady past. She was making progress when she was assaulted again by the cancer diagnosis. Following surgery, Ellie received both chemotherapy and radiation therapy. But these created fistulas, links, that caused leakage of urine and stool through her vagina. She began to speak of herself as an untouchable by personal and professional caregivers. Her final indignity was in her need for very intimate personal care. She despaired that the cervical cancer stigmatized her in the eyes of the nurses and doctors because of its association with sexual promiscuity. After transfer to a chronic care facility, Ellie's world was limited to her hospital room and adjacent bathroom. Pretty crappy real estate, don't you think, was her opening line to most visitors who really saw her face to face. Her blanket shrouded back was familiar to all. She refuses to eat because she doesn't want to spend the little time I have left on the toilet. Ellie believes it is fate that her crappy life is going to end in a medical condition where she's constantly unclean. She's lost all sense of dignity and of herself 
as a person worthy of care or attention. That's a story. I'm suggesting to you, in the time that we have, that Ellie's story would reveal to her family and to those who were trying to provide care deeper issues that must be addressed if they are in any way, in any way, to help retrieve some kind of care for her so that she can have a good death, so that she can have the kind of reconciliation with her loved ones that she needs. But the story, I hope, based on real, but my story of the story and facts, I think gives us a different sense of who and what she suffers. Just going to read a second story because we, I have a third one we're not going to get to. This is a different one. So you saw that pain is a source of suffering for many. So this is Joe's story. Joe, a widow, were and a proud grandfather of three, is still a large man at 67 years of age. Over six foot two, with broad shoulders and powerful legs, he was a football star at his youth and a construction worker for over 40 years. Hmm? Joe was a little loud and rough around the edges. All his life, he had worked, played, and lived hard. But he was described by all who knew him as a diamond in the rough with a heart of gold. A lifetime of manual labor and hard living had provided Joe with many experiences of pain. His approach to pain, like his approach to all difficulties in life, was to tough it out and not give in. While nature healed. This approach more or less worked for Joe until his wife, Francie, suddenly died after a car accident seven years ago. She was the love of his life and the gentle, peacemaking soul who helped soften and repair some of Joe's abrasive effects on family and friends. The loss of Francie sent him spiraling into a deep pit of despair. He developed problems with alcoholism and drugs, which nearly cost him his relationship with his only son, Randy, and his beloved grandchildren, Sophie and Kendall. When he realized what was at stake if he kept on drinking, he worked really hard to get sober. While in therapy, he learned much about himself and gained new insights about his response to pain and distress. He had drifted away from the faith of his childhood years ago, but he discovered the power of faith during his recovery. He'd been doing really well and was proud of the fact that he'd overcome the drinking problem. He had found a new hope that he now had a real chance to, in his words, make a lot of things right that I've done wrong. But suddenly things went horribly wrong for Joe. His back pain became so persistent that he could no longer ignore it or manage it with over-the-counter meds. Randy, the son, insisted he get medical attention. And after extensive investigation, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a cancer of the bone marrow. He managed a single course of chemotherapy in hopes of getting more time, but it had taken its toll on him physically and mentally. He was living at home with palliative care assistance. Whenever he was asked, he replied that his pain was manageable. Yet the palliative care nurse realized that the hearty, outgoing Joe was becoming more preoccupied, more immobile, more hesitant. Any movement could cause a resurgence of pain that would lead him to wither and withdraw, his face reflecting real fear. He's now reluctant to do anything that might cause him pain, but is even more reluctant to talk about managing his pain. Randy was really happy that his father has turned his life around. He visited often with his children. Joe was called Grandpa Bear by his 
adoring grandchildren because of his noisy, oversized hugs. <sighs> Grandpa Bear. On this visit, Joe was in great distress, and he was just not himself. He was aloof with the children and avoided hugging them because of the pain. The palliative care nurse visited just as the family left. She found Joe sitting on the bed with uncharacteristic tears in his eyes. When she gently inquired about things, he said, I hurt so much. I hurt all over. But I don't know what hurts most, my body, my dying, or not being able to hug the kids. As the nurse again approached the issue of better management of his pain, Joe admitted for the first time he wanted pain relief, but was terrified by becoming addicted to the pain medications because of his history. Pain control and other symptom control is crucial in helping people physically with what we call the last things. I forgive you, do you forgive me? I love you, thank you, I'm sorry. Those last things necessary for all of us. I'm gonna suggest that those of us who are disciples of Christ are continuing the never-ending story of Jesus' disciples. I think we have to prophetically resist the medicalization of suffering and death. We have to promote and improve palliative care. We have to protect the vulnerable among us. And we have to give prophetic witness to mercy, care, and companionship to those in our midst. Remember, the reasons people request medically assisted death are not about pain and physical symptom control. Hardly ever. They're about feelings of loss of dignity, dependence and loss of control, guilt at being a burden, isolation and loneliness, uncertainty regarding future care needs, hopelessness and loss of meaning. These, my friends, are issues of suffering. My Holy Father, Pope Francis, my BFF, In Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, says this. An evangelizing community, that communities of disciples of Christ, gets involved by word and deed in people's lives. It bridges distances. It is willing to abase itself if necessary. And it embraces human flesh, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. It is about the art of accompaniment. This is Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And so I'm asking you to think about your own story, your own personal story, your story of illness, your story of others' illness, but in a specific way here, in keeping with the call of this AST event, what story of accompaniment and care are you writing or will you write, particularly for those who are most vulnerable to requesting that their life be ended because no one is providing care and accompaniment. The acutely ill, chronically ill and handicapped, the mentally ill, frail and dependent elderly, dying, bereaved, the poor and those on the peripheries. Who and how will you accompany? As disciples of Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Um, we want to have some time for questions and comments, so um, sure. we will have a mic uh, for people to use. I'll ask you if you have a question, please short. If you make a comment, keep it even shorter. <laughs> <laughs>
because uh, you're not going to beat the lecture anyway. <coughs> you know. But uh, I'm not sure where you would like to be, feel most comfortable working here. Okay. Yeah, excuse me. Right. Stand right here. Then we can entertain some uh, questions. Or com uh, comments. I mean, it's your, I'm, I'm trying to get, I was trying to get you to think of, I mean, I'm hoping you were thinking of your story and the stories of your loved ones and the stories not only of personal ones, but those of you who are in pastoral care, spiritual care, nursing, medicine, what, what, and, 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 and just the, this issue of the power of the story itself. Just a quick comment. Thank you so much for that information and those stories were all very moving. Um, I just accompanied my 44-year-old son to his dying in the end of January, and I want to say, he died at home, holding my hand, but I want to say that the palliative care was amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, uh, just that accompaniment alone. Uh, but the healthcare professionals were there for him uh, every step of the way. It was a four-year process, but I can't say enough good things about uh, how they helped him deal with it all. Well, thank you, dear. So, l let me just say, so our sympathies are with you, but thank God your son had a good death. He had a good death. And just one observation. Regardless of what you, and I know across the Christian community is a little bit of a different uh, approach to the question of medically assisted de death. But this is what I want you to think about. I worked for 15 years with Sharon Karst, Senator Sharon Carstairs and others who were committed to providing that every Canadian whether you were in the city, urban or rural, had access to ac access accessible, effective hospice and palliative care everywhere in this country. Her last report, maybe five, six years ago now, was called Not There Yet. And to me, one of the great tragedies is we, the Supreme Court passed its decriminalization of medically assisted death before we delivered on the promise of hospice and palliative care. And you'll now know that, that even within the hospice palliative care community, there's now a challenge to whether or not hospice and palliative care is what Dame Cecily Saunders said it was and what the World Health Organization definition is. It neither hastens nor prolongs dying. Neither hastens nor prolongs. It's an alternative too. It's not in the little box that you, black box you've got now, you've got all kinds of stuff, and then you have medically assisted death. So this isn't just an issue for Christians and, and Catholics more specifically. This is an issue for, wait a minute, we had the cart and horse and wrong way around here. Uh, so that's why you saw very special, very special uh, sense for me. Con don't let hospice palliative care slip because this is now legalized. That's a danger, you understand that. That's a real danger. We, 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 as, as persons of justice as well as care, we've got to advocate. Um, this past November, um, well, it was from August, November, I had the uh, privilege of um, being in the company with my brother as he died. And I don't want to embarrass the person who's here tonight, but uh, Monica Flynn, who was the uh, palliative care nurse, was a companion for that whole time. And it was amazing what the services that are available and the partnership that you can develop. And I remember at the end when my brother was finished, he had a lung condition and he was desperate for breathing. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to talk with him, and Monica can verify this, that twice he was very concerned that this was assisted suicide and so right. on. Right. But it was really compassionate dying. And uh, I'll never ever forget the support that Monica and the team provided my brother and his family. So again, sympathies with you, Mike. And y y you see, this is really important. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I think this is objective, this is not new, this is objectively verified, the media of all types, including movies and television biopics or whatever you call them, 
are all valorizing medically assisted death. The issue of a good death in the sense of hospice and palliative care, dying at home accompanied without medical assistance in dying, never, never, never gets the front page. I think it was, I just checked not, recent, not too long ago, one story on uh, CBC in the last two years was a short little story about a, a, a good death at home. But we're dominated by that this is another, so something about our not being able to speak up enough about our experiences of a good death um, are really something very important. But your story, Mike, about your brother and shortness, see, I think shortness of breath <clears throat> personally is the most difficult symptom to manage at end of life, right? The nurses who do this would, would agree with me. Um, but that's, your, your brother's story and Joe's story are not dissimilar. Your brother thought that increasing the, the morphine and other medications because they make him drowsy would cause his death. We know properly titrated in palliative care, that doesn't happen. <laughs> People could be getting in palliative care 30 times the ordinary starting dose and they're tolerating it. It's a, it's a biologic phenomenon. Now, if I injected you with 30 times the usual dose, you'd stop breathing and die right here. It's a different, it's a different phenomena altogether. But, but the example, this is, isn't this crazy? Isn't this, talk about the paradoxes of our time. We have an opioid drug crisis that's killing young people and others. This is an epidemic, growing epidemic across our country. Getting pain medication for uses that will kill them and they shouldn't have. And yet we still have inadequate palliative care end of life pain control and symptom control. There's something not right here. Again, advocacy uh, is important, political. Mr. Kenny, I'm trying to formulate the question and the concern that I bring. Media looks at aging as leeches on society. Some of the stories in the media show that we are consuming time and money, um, forgetting that certain generations of us who are aging certainly um, contributed many, many things into society. Um, is aging simply a matter of survival and that we are taking up valuable time of doctors, hospitals, nurses, and medication? It's a concern. I hope I have expressed it so that it's understood. You expressed it perfectly, girl. <laughs> so if you get my book, you don't have just. <laughs> okay, let's let's put the, let's put this in perspective. I'm a sister of charity of Halifax. I don't earn a penny from this. The Sisters of Charity Retirement Fund might earn a little bit, <laughs> but not me personally. The the. The story of Gladys's story of aging and psychological suffering. It's a, it's a story of its own. Okay, so let me, I do a whole day on ethical issues in aging. So let me just, just briefly, this is so important. You talk about vulnerable, you talk about who's vulnerable. If you look at the demographics of Canadian society, we are aging rapidly. If it weren't, thank God for our immigrants, who bring in young children, our, our, our age would even, we're not as, we're not as average on, as old as Western Europe. Those nations have been aging even more rapidly than we. But Canada's aging. Nova Scotia's the old, eight, highest average age in the province because our young people go to Toronto to work and everybody wants to come back and retire. So this, this is important, this is important. Our, we have had a demographic shift we have had this expansion of medicine and technology, but what we've discovered is that we're mapping inappropriately the kinds of needs for the elderly population who are getting older and older, more with chronic illness, and also with residential needs. They need a place to go. So we can have a circumstance, and just like, like here with Gladys, an independent woman living alone, widowed, has a fall, gets into the hospital, they pay thousands and thousands of dollars to fix her, fix her hip, and then she's down in a waiting area because there's no place to send her and she can't go home anymore. So the, the, there are huge issues of vulnerability for this population. 
but let me go to a statistic. Now I'm really playing doctor, sorry. <laughs> can't, I can't help it. Everyone here knows that the highest amount of money per capita in North America, in Canada explicitly, is spent in the last year of your life. The highest percentage of that is in the last six months of your life, and the highest percentage of that is in the last month of your life. And that's what they wave about the tsunami of the elderly. Do you know why? Who can tell me why they're spending all that money in the last month of life? Can't Go. Can't hmm? You can't take it with you. No. Yeah. Be, uh, Hugh, uh, failure to accept <laughs> what's happening. This is inappropriate use of high technology. It's not proper palliative care, hospice care, goals of aging at all. I'm not talking about it. Uh, please understand. Nobody should be denied, denied an intervention or a treatment on age alone. That's ageism. That's as bad as sexism and racism, right? But we've gone wild nutsy. If, if you're totally incapable of accepting that dying is what's happening and preparing for that, and you're it's a denial, that's the story of a, of a young, much younger man in the beginning of the book, then you're constantly, or, or it's not the older person. It's their adult children. <laughs> serious, serious. Single communist consultation for secular ethics, everybody across Canada in hospitals, faith-based and other, is an elderly parent now dying with the sibs, the ch her adult children, in disagreement about what should happen to mama, and mama did not do advanced care planning, and mama did not appoint who it is that is to speak. So, huge problem. Some of you met much of the, the folks who do pastoral care must have seen this, the chaplains and families torn apart. I mean, I, I lecture on this and general t topics, you know, all over the place. You can't know how many people will come up to me and say, it's one of the great graces and the reason I continue doing this. Uh, they'll come up and say, Dr. Kenny, my mother died 10 years ago and I felt guilty ever since that I didn't agree with my brother and force her to go back to the operating room and you've just helped me understand, I did what mama wanted, which is what the person, the person who's speaking for you doesn't decide what they want. It's substituted judgment. They're supposed to be deciding as best they can as you would want. So, so we've got an interesting set of, and, uh, of issues. The thing that drives me crazy, just by the way, and I never announce this, I'm 74 tomorrow, so I'm very sensitive to aging. <laughs> But, but there's this huge, this huge, huge issue, isn't there? That we kind of want to have scapegoats for all this expensive technology and the cost. But the, the fact of the matter is, this is a misjudgment when it comes to care of the elderly and very elderly. It's the question of not having a conversation about what are the goals of care and what are the goals of care for you now and here and in this situation. So just, let's just say this as a Christian. If we can't talk about dying, who the can? <laughs> it drives me crazy. People saying, I mean, those of you who do palliative care, you know this conversation. Um, no, no, don't, don't mention the palliative care word to my mother. And when, when docs, when we talk about it between and among ourselves, it's the P word. It's the P word. They'll say, you know, my mother will give up hope. Your mother is 86 and she's dying. What, what hope are you talking about that she's giving up? If it's hope for cure, that's just an unfounded hope. But you, we hope for many things. We hope for the legacy of a good death. We, right, there's all kinds of things. So, but, but what I'm challenging you for here is, if Christians don't believe that dying he destroyed our death, rising he restored our life, if we don't believe that in the communion of the saints, I'm a Celt, I talk to my getting my nana and my mother and father and Bishop Hayes all the time. <laughs> Give me a break and I'm not, you know. <laughs> I don't want to push it too far. <laughs> but the point I'm making is I get enraged that people make this a claim uh, of some kind of inappropriate eating up of resources for the elderly. It's not only factually untrue, it then requires a proper understanding of the goals of care, but there's another interesting justice question here. 
The only way we think of justice is here and now with individuals getting their fair share. What about intergenerational justice? Intergenerational justice goes this way. It doesn't go this way. Um, and then just one of the things that get, again, my, my BFF, Holy Father Francis, he's, he, he loved his nonna. He, if you read his, he loved his grandma. He, he, she lived right around the corner from him when he was growing up in Argentina. So he, um, he writes very powerfully about care of the elderly. And he says, in one of his quotes, those who do not care, those societies that don't care for the elderly, have no hope of a future because they've lost their roots. So there's a, there's a, and this is where the thing about faith being connected, remember, I, I, I absolutely believe the, the great thing about belonging to a religion is that when my faith is weak, I'm hoping to God that yours is strong. And, 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 and it works both ways. It's like a good marriage. It's never 50-50. Sometimes it's 10, 80, sometimes it's 20, 70, right? It's just got to average out <laughs> to some kind of mutuality. So, one more. Done? Done? We're done? No, go ahead. Thank you very much, Sister, for your presentation. Um, two quick questions for you. In terms of the writing of the case history, how do you see the role of the chaplain in telling that story on the medical records? And is there a case for the training of the rest of the medical staff or some sensitization around issues of meaning and spiritual care? And then my second question has to do with the possibilities of dialogue. Of what? Of dialogue among Christians with different perspectives Correct. on MAID. Correct. Is, is there any possibility of creating that kind of space? Two big questions. So the first one, having been involved in medical education for ages, and not, not more in the past six years, less so, uh, in, in, in this Dalhousie, there have been all kinds of attempts at interdisciplinary education where doctors, nurses, and chaplaincy students, the people who are, have sessions together, and that's really important. It's just that it's a small effort, but it's an important effort because the perspectives of doctors and nurses and chaplains about the same patient are different. And it's only when all of them share do you have a sense of kind of a, a, a richer understanding. So there have been some attempts. There have been attempts in the writing of cases for study, there have been attempts to change and improve and include the so, what's called the social history in, in the medical record. And I'm not very happy with any of that. Um, and interestingly, a, a session that I just came from, from the Catholic Health Alliance of Canada in Niagara Falls last week, a nurse there was talking about the problem of the electronic medical record for nurses. So I have to follow up on this, but she was. The fact that nurses now have a little, like a, your tablet, and that when they do sign out at the, at the end of their round, they have to check, you know, what did, did you see Mr. Jones? Did you see Mrs. Smith? And, and the, there are questions about their care. And this nurse was compelling, compelling with, because it, she was using it as an example of belief in technology, and that the technology can distance from the patient so that, the nurse is looking at this, not at this, right? And then, because it's short cut, it isn't the same as having to write out, look, John Smith and I had a long conversation. He is really down tonight. He's really down tonight. There's something happening at home, and we better pay, just pay. That's the kind of thing nurses could, they could have passed that in hand out. So the challenges actually are getting bigger um, because efficiency and speed and pressure of time, it's the biggest thing that, that healthcare providers, even the good ones who want to do more, uh, about listening and caring and, and, and more being more attentive to patient experience. Push, push, push procedures. Now there are disincentives. If, if you're, for, this, for your condition, if the average length of stay is three days, if you're still here on day four, the hospital is dinged. I mean, we, we are, we're, we're, 
partly it's just it's the demand and how much we can do. But they all mitigate against this other interactional thing. So uh, that's why I think we need to be prophetically resistant, constantly raising those questions. The second comment that you had was uh, the dialogue across Christian traditions. As my good Jewish friends say, from your mouth to God's ears, <laughs> I only wish, I only wish, we don't have, I've read the Anglican statement on this, read the Lutheran, in fact, a good nursing, nursing ethicist friend of mine is was very involved with the Lutheran uh, position paper on medically assisted death. Um, I'm not sure why it is that what I see as the issue with it, which is the medicalization of suffering. It's the medicalization of, there, most suffering does not occur with a medical condition. Most suffering does not occur with a medical condition. So I use this example that if he has chest pain, but she has heartache, with chest pain, I and my colleagues in medicine, boy, do we have stuff we can do for you. We can ream it out, we can put a pacemaker in, we can do, we, we, we all kinds of stuff. Not guarantees, but stuff that can help. She's got heartache. She's got heartache because her son has been lost to drugs and prostitution in the streets of Vancouver for two years and she doesn't know where he is. And every single solitary day she wakes and her heart is heavy all of the time because Danny is, she doesn't know where Danny is, she doesn't know how, this is most of the suffering that people experience. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the medical condition. So that's why you see this, and this is where prophetic resistance becomes important. Medically assisted death is a technological answer. It's, I can't, I don't have a drug or device to relieve your suffering, so I'm gonna use death as a treatment and figure if you're not here, you're not suffering. It, it, it's gotta be resisted at its root, and I, I, I only wish that we did have a dialogue. Um, so maybe we both pray and work for that as, as best we can. And AST is a great place to talk about that. Okay, we're done. I'm glad to uh, signal that we're going to come to a close. Um, Dr. Kenny, thank you so much for your lecture tonight, lecture. <laughs>
but at the same time, it was great that you came out in such numbers and that you support the school and the Hayes Center. Indeed, um, keep an eye out for future events coming along, and we hope that you'll be with us uh, as well in those. So thank you so much to all of you, and good evening.